Any dogs need petting? <laughs> Good dog. Welcome to the Folk School on Willow Creek, featuring University Distinguished Professor Tom Ezern singing and telling stories from the Salon on Willow Creek. I need a bed for the night, boys, and my horses need hay. I've been riding that grub line on the hot dish highway. Now, oh Lord, please lend thine ear the prayer of a cattle king to hear. No doubt many prayers to thee seem strange, but I want you to bless our cattle. Jumping right in tonight on a ballad we're going to be added to adding to the Willow Creek song bag, the Cattleman's, the excuse me, the Cattle King's Prayer, and it's uh, a discovery of about a month ago, uh, tracing back on the uh, a song that's a commonplace at uh, cowboy church services, cowboy poetry uh, gatherings across the western United States and on out to the East Coast. In the case of this cowboy church phenomenon and um, you know uh, to discover something like that, like that the original text is something that's passed down through shadowy channels over the years and then just to nail it back down in this case to 1886 oh that, that that's a delight been mulling on it ever since and kind of wrote it up so we're ready to put it into the song bag and uh, Dr. Kelly is going to help me out with that here I think by starting out with some of the the provenance of this thing. Where does it come from? Across the western United States, and even in New York, western writers take part in what is known as cowboy church. The cowboy church movement is commonly credited to Glenn Smith, an ex-rodeo clown who was inspired with the idea and made an enterprise of it. A common place at Cowboy Church, and also at Cowboy Poetry Gatherings, is a song or recitation titled The Cowman's Prayer, also known as The Cattleman's Prayer. Although varying slightly from the original poem of 1886, The Cattle King's Prayer, the modern renditions all closely resemble it. They are listed as unattributed, which is to say, origin unknown. Until the recent discovery of the Cattle King's Prayer, the original text as published in the Fort Benton River Press, 22 September 1886, in Montana. Previous scholarship had traced the ballad only as far back as October of 1886, in New Mexico's Socorro Bulletin. Given the efficiency of railroad networks and the exchange system of Western newspapers, it was quite feasible for the composition to have traveled from Montana to New Mexico in five weeks' time. The editor of the Fort Benton paper published the poem with this note. The following was picked up on the streets a few days ago. Who the author is, we could not ascertain. The editor did know the author's identity, however, as he subsequently engaged in a guessing game about it with his readers, without revealing it. Jack Thorpe, John Lomax, and other song catchers and collectors included the Cattleman's Prayer or the Cowman's Prayer in their publications, and various Western newspapers in the United States and Canada published 20th century texts. None identified an author, but a retrospective feature article back in the newspaper of origin, the River Press, 29 March 1930, 
provides pertinent evidence, an 1886 photograph of four men in Fort Benton, cattlemen and others, including a steamboat captain, captioned to be reading the text of the Cattle King's Prayer. The dapper Cattle King, reading from the text in the photo, is a well-known stockman named John Lepley. He is the likely author. Well, I'm going to be singing a bit of this ballad at this meeting coming up in uh, Stavanger in a couple of weeks. So we better get a little bit of context to it. Let's make it history. I just happen to have some here. In the context of the ballad and its time, Lepley was remarkably prescient. He seems, by his petitions, to sense the disaster that is about to strike. 1886 already had been a hard year on the Montana range. Severe drought had struck, prairie fires had been recurrent, and forage was scarce. Impending was the snowy blue winter of 1886-87, which would precipitate what came to be known as the Great Die-Off. This was the winter that inspired Charlie Russell's famous watercolor, Waiting for a Chinook. Although the hard winter did not wipe out the big cattle outfits, it took the shine off western ranching as a home for speculative capital. It opened the range to sheepmen and encouraged the rise of smaller, family-based cattle ranching operations. The Cattle King's prayer surely was heard, but the Almighty's answer was not what was requested. Okay, you ready to annotate this? Starting from the top. Now, oh Lord, please lend mine ear the prayer of the cattle king to hear. Cattle king was a spoof term, somewhat derogatory, applied in the early 1880s to speculative cattle operators on the Western Range. Its use in this ballad indicates that the cattle kings themselves, whether in vainglory or self-deprecation, themselves embraced its use. No doubt many prayers to thee seem strange, but won't you bless our cattle range? and thus has dropped out of modern versions of the poem. It is, however, a vivid and exceedingly meaningful term used by sodden British folk in reference to the cerulean heavens of the Bel Pais. Gram searches <laughs> Instagram searches disclose the literary popularity of the phrase during the 19th century, but not the 18th or 20th. Prairie fire, won't you please stop? Let thunder roll and the water drop. It frighten me, see the smoke, unless it stops.
I think at least five cents per pound should be the price of beef a year round. Whereas beef prices during the 1870s ranged from four dollars per hundred weight up to five dollars, in 1880 they slid below four dollars where they remained. The world surplus of beef, more than the hard winter of 1886-87, brought down the speculative western cattle industry. From Samuel Western, the Wyoming cattle boom, 1868-1886. One more thing, then I'm through. Instead of one calf, give my cows two. The Balladeer's final petition is a be careful what you wish for proposition. The proliferation of twin calves sounds lucrative, but in fact, twinning results in less vigorous calves, birthing difficulties, problems with heifers refusing one calf, but worst of all, Free Martinism, or Infertility of a Female Calf, from Rachel Gable, Seeing Double, Birthing Twins. I may pray different than other men, still I've had my say, so now, amen. A canine action here tonight, Dr. Kelly. They're on alert. Rabbits or gophers? Too fast for me to see. <laughs> well, I don't know. There, there's some things to talk about. For one thing, we'll make a more formal announcement later on. We're going to take two weeks off from the Willow Creek Folk School because we're headed for Norway. Uh, that's Tuesday. Yeah, next Tuesday, Tuesday next, isn't yes. it? Next Tuesday. And it just gets too complicated go, uh, operating from hotels abroad uh, to stream this thing out. You know, the security protocols and when we're away from, away from home, it just, it really gets complicated. Uh, so two weeks off, you're, you're, you're rid of us for a while. Um, I, I am not kidding. I wasn't kidding. That's the Cattle King's Prayer will feature in a paper I'll be delivering to the Agricultural History Society in Stavanger, which some of you may know know as the uh, capital of the Norwegian petroleum industry, but also exceedingly historic town. And uh, we'll spend a little bit of time wandering around Western Norway since we're taking, spending all the money to fly over there in the first place. Yeah. Agricultural History Society, Society, it's business, right? For the most part. Yeah, for, yeah, for the <laughs> most part. And we've had, we've minded some business this week included, but often it's darn pleasant. Uh, I make no secret of my sense that uh, Dr. Kelly is, should I use the word matron? Carefully. Okay, the, the matron of a, uh, an efflorescence of letters on the Northern Plains uh, uh, with uh, North Dakota State University Press. And we had an exceedingly pleasant luncheon here a day or two ago, just yesterday, wasn't yesterday, it? Yesterday. Yeah, yes. at Kringen Lodge of the Sunway, Sons of Norway here in Fargo with uh, Mark Vins. Why, do we, why were we out with Mark? <laughs> well, first of all, we just needed to check in with him. Um, we haven't seen him in quite a while, and he lost his wife of, I don't even know how many years, but a lifetime. He lost his wife, Betsy, in May, um, and we just wanted to check in with him and see how he's doing. He's holding up well. He's uh, taking care of himself, and he has two daughters who help with that. So he's we're a prince of a fellow, yeah. and a hell of a poet. <laughs> and sort of the um, point guard or riding point for 
a previous efflorescence of letters in this part of the country, dating from the, oh, you know, 1970s about, yeah, right? Would that, the, that be nailing it? In the 1970s and 80s, he was here um, teaching at Minnesota State and uh, teaching in the English department there, teaching writing, but also editing um, the Dakota Territory Journal. Yeah, small uh, literary journal. Uh, one of the first pub poets they published back then was Joy Harjo. That was fun oh, yeah, to yeah. find in the collections. But he and and Joe Richardson and, and a bunch of people out here were taking care uh, to make sure that poetry was getting shared across the, the northern territories here. <laughs> they made put a lot of miles on and they um, fostered the careers of a lot of people. You know, Mark credits Tom McGrath as the center of that literary movement. You know, I don't think of McGrath as leadership material other than for poetic inspiration. Somebody had to make things work, like see that the journal got out, out on time, got see that the readings and the programs and things got set up and uh, and happened and uh, yeah, I, I've got a hunch right. that our friend Mr. Vince is that guy. He is and uh, his wife Betsy did all the typing with he, so it was definitely a partnership <coughs> there. Um, uh, Mark was honored last year along with Deborah Marquardt and Louise Erdrich as literary personages of the region and by the North Dakota Humanities Council and that was quite a deal um, that was uh, um, videotaped, I don't know if that's what they do. Yeah, a lot but, of people saw that, but, saw that on Prairie Public. Yeah, yeah, on the public radio here. And also the, that was the same time that we published Mark's latest book, um, the Trouble with Daydreams. So we were really glad to have a part in that. And just glad to catch up with Mark and hear some of the old stories from the from decades ago on into what's going on today with publishing. Well, yeah, that's our news from the press. <laughs> Networking, uh, homage, and benefiting from experience. I tell you, um, one other thing I'm going to mention here, it's not on your program there, Dr. K. Uh, we were talking about this earlier. We, we have been together, you know, just about 20 years. Yes. And celebrating 15th uh, anniversary of our marriage here in a few days. It'll happen while we're in Norway. Who, who knows what we'll be doing? I don't know if we're on a train or what at, at that time, but that'll just be on the fly. So we're doing a few things to observe here now. Uh, yesterday, we went out to Cheyenne Gardens, and this is something we do every year. Pick out a couple of uh, showy iris plants, and we plant them in this back border that sometimes you see through the windows. And uh, they are a source of joy to us every June, and of course, a commemoration. Uh, so we'll put those in the ground here sometime this weekend. Before we go, yeah. Uh, I've also, and we're not much for gifts, you know. Uh, uh, we'd prefer to, um, you know, uh, give time, I guess. And um, I've uh, told Dr. Kelly, well, maybe I should take you out to supper somewhere tomorrow night. It's like the only night we'd have the chance to do it. It's not our anniversary technically, but you know, we're, it's one of those rolling, uh, celebra rolling celebrations, a fairly big one this year. If anybody wants to wish Dr. Kelly a happy anniversary, <laughs> the chat line is open. But also, if you have a good su suggestion of some place we haven't thought of that she should be going out to eat tomorrow night, drop that in there also. That's a good idea. Yeah. Uh, rolling on. Uh, ballad number two tonight is the Abreis von Riga. And uh, we put uh, departures as our theme, you know. We're taking off for Norway next week, and this is a, a great departure song. And we're, what we're commemorating is, uh, I've come to call it Manifesto Day. It needs a better day. It's the, the commemoration of the 22nd of July, 1763, when Catherine the Great of Russia invited foreigners, specifically Germans, to come in and settled the undeveloped lands on the steppes of, in the, of the Russian Empire. Now, most of our German Russians here in the North Dakota and South Dakota 
were not responded to this particular particular invitation. They they responded to a later one from uh, um, Alexander the Great, but this was from uh, or Alexander the Second. This is from Catherine the Great in 1763, and it resulted in the migration to the Volga River colonies. So we got a ballad from the Volga German colonists, the Abreis von Riga, that means the departure from Riga. Now, how do we have this ballad? Well, the text I'm working with, not the translation, I did my own because I needed a singable one, but the text I'm getting from a 1975 thesis at Emporia, Kansas State College, that's Emporia State University now, by one Thomas J. Hoffman, who I have not been able to trace. There are some other Thomas J. Hoffmans, but I haven't been able to sort out just what happened to Thomas J. Hoffman after he did his master's in foreign languages in German at, uh, at, at Emporia in 1975. His thesis, A Cultural History of the Volga Germans in Ellis County with special reference to their music. And he explains that this is not a song exactly of the immigration from Russia to North America where they settled in places like western Kansas, eastern Colorado, western Nebraska, and scatterings in other parts of the plains. But that's their center for the Volga Deutsch on the central plains. It's actually a song of their previous migration, where many of them staged out of central and northern Europe at Riga in Latvia, there to go across into the Russian Empire. Uh, so it's the Abreis von Riga, the departure from Riga. And the plot of it, I don't, I'm not going to explain it too much, but I think there's a whole lot of German-Russian mentalité in this. We are flotsam of history. Uh, we are beat up by nameless authorities wherever we go, but we still keep on going. Uh, there's there's a, sum, a plot summary if I ever heard one. Uh, now, how does uh, Mr. Hoffman know about this in 1975? He gets his information from Nick Fannensteel and particularly Lawrence Weigel of Hayes, Kansas. Lawrence Weigel is a great collector of folklore and history. And most of his collections are in the Fort Hayes State University Library in Hayes, Kansas. Um, this song, I often use this with my classes, the North American Plains at NDSU, to talk about the immigrant experience coming to the Great Plains and the essential tragedy of the original immigrant generation. They never got over this. The second generation might root in the land, yes, but the first generation, they never got over the trauma of immigration. You're going to see that in the song that I'll sing. Uh, but here is another law, song that is more specifically, uh, okay, the Abreis von Riga was about going into Russia, and then as they came out of Russia, they carried that song again with them in the next migration and carried it and brought it to North America with them. Um, another song of the uh, Atlantic migration then, Litzerblick auf Europa. I'm going to read you, I've got, I've, I translated into English here to make it better, easy for everybody. There is Europe's last shore. The captain calls us on board. Oh, I feel like I had to look back again. And I turn and look back, long and steady, until dusk fell and the distant shore dwindled. Farewell forever always. I called out into the night, bathed in the moonlight. The roar of the waves quieted. And so I stood on the ship, dreamy all night, a farewell so gripping I never imagined. Now, the Abreis von Riga, each stanza, I'll sing the original German and then uh, my own English translation. Die Abreis von Riga, die fällt mir so schwer, through a day, du schönes Mädchen. The departure from Riga is breaking my heart. You 
little maiden, farewell then, now forever we must part. Beautiful maiden, farewell then, now forever we must part. Saying the ends, never be there, so open she, dear glue. Do wine songs dare you lean? Care no rhyme of the rook. Do wine songs to you lean? Care no rhyme of the rook. If we never meet again, then go with my love and my prayer that we may get. Sundag morgen, kom der lunchman on board. Fresh out, er matte rosen, heute müssen wir vor. Fresh out, er matte rosen, heute müssen wir vor. So it was on Sunday morning, came the mate on board to say, Wake up, make things ready, this ship is sailing now, today. Sailors wake up and make things ready, this ship is sailing now, today. Gosh, wrong in the models and garden, den grade hoy. Ich bin ja nicht schuld, denn eure Kapitäne haben keine Geduld. Denn eure Kapitäne haben keine Geduld. It isn't my fault, so the maid said, this is the day of rest I know. They who say that we must go But it's the captains, they're impatient It's they who say that we must go Da sprangen die Matarosen im Schiffboot hinaus Den Anker zu fassen, dort fuhren sie raus Well, nothing could be done about it. The sailors wait anchor to depart. The captains had given out their orders, so we sailed with heavy heart. The captains had given out their orders, so we sailed with heavy heart. Und auch sie dort fuhren, das Wetter sich erholen, die Wellen, die schlugen, das Schiff ging immer vor. Die Wellen, die schlugen, das Schiff ging immer vor. Now when the ship reached open water, riding a pair, 
Pounded by storms, our ship kept sailing, pushing onward to the west. Pounded by storms, our ship kept sailing, pushing onward to the west. Those of you who make note of such things find that that each stanza, stanza and refrain ends on the third rather than on the tonic, which leaves us hanging, doesn't it? And wondering, did they ever get to America? Well, they did, <laughs> and that's why this song is still sung in places like Victoria, Kansas, you see. It made it. We got any guests on the chat line tonight, Dr. K? We do. And um, Dr. Lori Lalam just remarked how much she loves that song. I, I have to steal myself and practice it beforehand so I don't, I don't tear up with yeah. that. And it's the, the melody, you see. Okay, if you study a little bit of folk song theory, and that, that goes back for me to like 1972 with Bill Behrens and the Bethany College, you study how a melody in a lyric song like this, get ya. Through my day, shame is made. Can, oh, crying in your beer. <laughs> it yeah. works, it works. So hello to Lori. See you, and see, we'll see her in Stavanger. That's, that's right, yeah. that's right. Um, Stan recommends that for our anniversary dinner, we take a drive to the Cattleman's Club in Pier. South Dakota. That's a little bit. <laughs> Apparently he liked it. I, I, I think he does, yeah. Yeah, and, and probably he recommends a bottle of, uh, what's that whiskey he drinks there? Well, the Buffalo Trace, yeah. I'm trying to pull this back up here. Bo Schmaltz. Bo Schmaltz. Oh, great to hear yeah. from Bo. He said he wondered if you had asked me if I wanted to go to McDonald's or Burger King. No, neither and, one of those and, was mentioned. And I Bo, said, neither one came up. And he um, predicts that I would have said no way, but you thought I said Norway. <laughs> <laughs> so that's where we're going. Well, speaking of departures, of course, uh, that's been kind of a theme in our part of the country. The Great Plains in general, but particularly the Northern Plains, uh, the migrations of people in, of course, which just been singing about, and the migrations of people out. Uh, most people my age grew up with this, uh, and that uh, uh, most of our classmates, wherever we're from, moved on somewhere else. Most of our siblings moved on somewhere else. And, um, but in between, and Molly uh, Rosen talks about this in her, her book, uh, writing about the generation that grew up on the land and took root there and created a, a sense of identity and place there that developed into a larger regional consciousness, you see. Um, one of the people she writes about quite a bit is a guy named Clell Gannon from Bismarck, North Dakota. And someone else who's writing about him is Aaron Barth in his dissertation. Who's watching tonight, by the way. And, and uh, Aaron and Molly are observing a birthday in their household. Do you notice that? Aaron and a different Molly. The different Molly. <laughs> yeah. It's Molly McLean. Let's make that plain. You only, only get one Molly. They're both wonderful, wonderful gals, but you only get one out of them. Yeah, they're celebrating the third birthday of their daughter, Anya. Oh, my goodness. It's gone fast for us. Uh, Anya, also otherwise known as Future Heartbreaker <laughs> of Bismarck, North Dakota. Yeah. Well, at any rate, uh, what was I talking about? Oh, Cloud Gannon. He figures in that dissertation, which is going to happen eventually, right? There and there, sure, it's going. Um, and Claude Gannon, I was remarking to people earlier this week, there are two really popular poets in North Dakota in the early 20th century. Uh, James Foley, who's kind of the first poet laureate of North Dakota, and uh, Claude Gannon. 
Gannon's one with heart. <laughs> and um, consequently, we're bringing for, out forth from him in this term of, in terms of migration and going and coming, uh, his uh, poem, The Law of Dakota. It's from his book, this one, Songs of the Bunchgrass Acres. I want you to know something. Look at this. Oh, all right, in the first place, this is like a homegrown publication. Look at this, Dr. K, as far as homegrown production values. Isn't and that embossed pretty? cover. Isn't that gorgeous? That's his own you artwork. Like the texture on there too. His own artwork. Oh, yeah, and the texture of the, the, of the cover in itself. And then the embossed imagery and the titles. Yeah. See? <laughs> Just read that with your fingers, right? And, and right smack in the middle of it, you know, library sticks a barcode. <laughs> Oh jeez, this is this is why we can't have nice things. They took the bark. I'll, I'll be speaking with the librarian about this. You know, you know this needs. There, there's quite a number of works that are way back in dingy storage that need to be brought into proper uh, reference, and I think I can help with that. And this is one of them. I need my own first edition of this too, Doctor K. Uh, I, did you ever know Grail Gannon, Clell's son? I did, yes. Yeah, okay. I, I've got here somewhere, yeah. Okay, Gannon's a, a bit of a Renaissance man. Uh, Jack Dewar has written a little piece about him for Dakota Date book on Prairie Public, um, uh, noting how he, wrote, he did the courthouse murals in the Burley County Courthouse. Born in 1900 in Nebraska, Family moved to a farm near Underwood in North Dakota after graduating high school. And then Dura just says casually, he studied at the Art Institute of Chicago for two years. <laughs> just casually, wandered off to the Art Institute of Chicago, came back, worked for the, as in a clerical position for the Sioux Line Railway, became an artist for an insurance company. And so all the stuff that he, we remember him for, his poetry, his painting, it's a sideline for him. He was on that famous 1926 canoe trip with George Will and Russell Reed down the Little Missouri River and into the Missouri. Now, let's see, what have I got? Oh, yeah. So, when, in the publication of one of his later books, Ever and Always I Shall Love the Land, his son Clell writes this. Here we go. Clell Gannon, did I say that? His, his, son Gra uh, his son Grail. Yeah. His son Grail Gannon writes this. Clell Gannon was like the pasque flower blooming on the brown prairies of home. It is God's own mystery how the country boy could come from the simple life of Dakota to ponder the beauties of the Renaissance on the panels and canvases of the Art Institute of Chicago, or to find excitement in the great operas that played in that city, and then return home once again to find himself forever in the simplicity of sun and rain, butte and sky, rabbit and coyote. Unlike most Dakotans, he never ceased to live in the great world of human history. But unlike most sophisticates, he loved the little world outside his door, and he saw reflected in it the majesty of the universe and the hand of God. This is the law of Dakota. From Clell Gannon's Songs of the Bunch Grass Acres. Now there's a law how it rains in Dakota It's not on the books of the state But it rules every native-born offspring That ever was born on a day And it rules every immigrant settler Who ever has lived in the West For it won't let him go from the Westland if it does, not let him rest. It's the law of the land and the people, the law of the simple and great. It rules nearly all of the people, nine times out of ten is the raid. For it rules the rich man and the beggar, the foolish one, yea, and the wise.
the Dakota Who wandered away from the sod Though he be native born or adopted Disciple of Satan or God Must return to the land of his people Or never be happy again Though he travel the vampire world over For ten million miles twice ten Hate the law, perhaps good reason, ignore it or curse it like sin. But like sin, when it gets you, it keeps you, and counts you as one of its kin. It's a curse of the buttes and the prairies, a curse of the sky and the sun. It's the law of the infinite spaces and the revelation of God. Sown your last bushel of wheat. Pass your pack your last egg to the market. Have bought brand new shoes for your feet. You're gone to leave certain by winter. Bid farewell to cousin and aunt. You and winter are still in Dakota. Each wants to get out, but he can. You may, may have been born in the Van Eyen. Singapore, Sitka, or Rome. But if once you have lived in Dakota, if once you have known it as home, it has gripped you a slave to its worship, a slave, yes, a lover, a friend. But the long, long, long trail leads to Dakota, and every known trail has its end. Thank you, Clell. Again. Well, we got a calendar ballad this week. I was inspired by quite a person, personage. I don't know if Nancy Kelly's online there tonight, but she'd know who I'm talking about. John James Ingalls, eminent United 19th century United States Senator for my home state of Kansas. He was an arrogant. Let's just leave it there. He was an arrogant fellow, <laughs> but a, a beautifully arrogant fellow. Nancy, who was the fellow who played Ingalls in the Kansas Chautauqua for us? Yeah, you, 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 co co coach me up on that. I'm trying to remember. The KU guy who played John James Ingalls. Uh, the, uh, 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 his literary brilliance although flowery in the overblown style that doesn't pass muster anymore today, but certainly did then. Uh, racist is all get out. Uh, but, but you almost take, take his, his writing as, as comedy, which it, to a good degree it is. It's satire. It's sat, uh, 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 of uh, public affairs of his time. Um, he's well known for a number of essays, one of them called The Catfish Aristocracy. You wonder where this is going to. I wanted to do a calendar ballad about fishing because we're coming to kind of a, the, the, a toggle point on fishing in the northern plains right now. Uh, when the cold water fishing is not so good anymore and we're, we're turning to another species. And um, that's what the song is going to be about. Well, and the, and the hint is his essay, Catfish Aristocracy. What he's writing about, of course, is the low-life people who live down on the river bottom of the Kansas River and its tributaries, who are descendants of the Confederates and the um, pro-slavery colonizers, and they are trash. And he asserts, Kansas is the child of Plymouth Rock, respectable people, or New Englanders, in other words. Uh, the Yankee is his ideal. Wheresoever he pauses in his triumphal career, the telegraph, the printing press, the sewing machine, and the innumerable achievements of his genius signalize his beneficent presence, render the burdens of life less degrading, and ennoble the soul by the consciousness of its powers to bless the race. Now, there are a whole lot of people who won't agree about the uh, perfect beneficence of the Yankee presence, <laughs> on the prairies. One of them would be our friend, uh, Denise Lajmadir. You understand she had a flat tire on the way to the powwow. That's there. right. We, ho we hope she made it to the grand entry. Uh, well, at any rate, uh, she wouldn't care for John Ingalls. 
uh, people of uh, descendant of immigrants talk like us. Well, you know, he doesn't care that much for us either. Uh, but the catfish aristocracy, it, it's worth a read. You can find it online. So with apologies to John Ingalls, I have my ballot, the catfish aristocracy. And I, I you know, I just wanted to, I've got some few things, to, a few things to say about the selection of sport fishes in this part of the country. <laughs> Okay, ready? One day in May, I thought I'd like to catch what they call a walleye pike. I baited up, waited for a strike, but all I got was a nibble. On your line of walleyes, that's just dead weight, but people around here think they're just great. They fry up nice at any rate, with that I will not quibble. Love that fish with a toothy mouth When his tail turns north and his head turns south And he leaps from the water like a late rainbow trout Fighting to be free I remember when that big fish struck I thought that I hooked a pickup truck Just bait a treble hook with a mallard duck It's northern pike for me When northern summer waxes hot there's a fish still waiting to be caught. He's got no scales and he's slick as snot, handsome as can be. He's got a mustache like a gambling man. He's pretty darn good in the frying pan. There's a high tone club, join it if you can. The catfish aristocracy. ship reached open water, riding a perilous crest. Pounded by storms, our ship kept sailing, pushing on to the west. conclude today's edition of the Folk School on Willow Creek. We invite you to join us again August 12th, Friday, 8 p.m. Central Time, for more songs and stories. <laughs>